you know, in John 3.16, it says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And uh, when we think about the plan of redemption, when we think about the scripture, uh, probably the overarching theme of the word of God is God's glory and God's love for the human race and his pursuit of them. Now the question is, how does this relate to God's election of the Jewish people, of the nation of Israel? Now, when we think about the election of Israel, the place that we usually go to is Genesis chapter 12, where God spoke to Abraham and so forth. But I believe that to start in Genesis 12, you're starting, you're starting too late in the journey. And you can come up with some conclusions that I don't think the Lord or the scripture intends us to understand about Genesis chapter 12. And so to understand Genesis 12 and how God's election of Abraham is related to God's love for, um, for the world, we have to start in Genesis 1. And Genesis 1 through 11, I think that those uh, 11 chapters really give us some insight into what is happening in Genesis 12 and how God's election of Abraham, yea, the nation of Israel, is related to the redemption of the world. One of the things that we see is that in Genesis chapter 1, and in Genesis 2, you know, it's the story of Adam and Eve and so forth. And, and of course, they disobey God. They eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord does something very interesting. There's two things that God does in his interaction with Adam and Eve that becomes a pattern of some sort that you see unfold in Genesis 1 to 11 and then 12. And then actually, I think all throughout the rest of the scripture. And what we see is that God uh, uh, pronounces a judgment on Adam and Eve, but he also provides redemption. We see the, the judgment in that uh, you're gonna work with the sweat of your brow. Uh, there's gonna be pain uh, in, in your labors. He pronounces judgment over the serpent and that, he, that his head will be crushed by the seed of the woman. But you also see that God um, offers clothing for Adam and Eve. Yes, you remember that they clothed themselves with fig leaves, but God makes it very clear. He says, look, he says, it's not good enough for you to clothe yourself uh, in your shame. I am the one that's gonna provide for your shame. And so we see the first shedding of blood. And essentially he kills an animal and to, uh, to clothe Adam and Eve with their shame. And so we see his redemption, his mercy there to redeem them from their sin. But we also see his, uh, his judgment in that he pronounces a consequence over uh, over their life. Now the next thing you see is it was Cain and Abel. Cain, uh, he, he kills his brother Abel, the same thing. God pronounces a judgment over uh, over, uh, over Cain, but he also marks him as a, uh, uh, as, as a sign of mercy. The next pattern we see, we see is with, uh, with Noah and his generation. God says, look, I'm gonna send a flood, I'm gonna judge the nations, but I'm gonna provide an ark. We see that pattern of, judge, of judgment and redemption there, or judgment and salvation. Then what we see is with the, with the Tower of Babel. We see humanity once again rebelling against God, and God says, you know what? I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna cause confusion. We see this judgment. Now what is happening is the nations, they're wanting to make a, uh, I said they're wanting to make a great name for themselves, it says. And God says, this is not good. He comes down and he brings about judgment. The question now is, where is the redemption? The redemption is in Genesis 12 when he calls Abraham. And what happens is in Genesis 11, God releases his judgment on the nations and he scatters them. But what you see in Genesis 12 is that, is, is that God is not done with the nations that he scattered. In fact, it says it is through you, it says, he says in Genesis 12, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But what are the nations that he's talking about? He's talking about the nations that he scattered in Genesis 11. So God scatters the nations um, in, in Genesis 11, but then out of mercy, he reaches out to Abraham and he calls him uh, uh, to himself. Now what is interesting is that it's very tempted to look at Abraham as a, uh, as a Sunday school figure, so to speak. But the truth is, is that Abraham more than likely was a part of the Genesis 11 crew who was trying to make a, name, a great name for himself. And I love how God speaks to Abraham and says, Abraham, it's not that I don't want you to have a great name. He goes, I want to be the one that gives it to you. I don't want you to do it in your own strength, in your own way. So if he tells him in Genesis 12, I will make you a great name. In Joshua 24, verse three, it says that the fathers beyond the river of, of um, that beyond the river of uh, the, the, uh, the Euphrates River, it says that they were worshiping other gods, referring to Abraham's family. So Abraham was not a God fearer, so to speak, when God came after him. So again, we see God reaching in mercy to the very people that rebelled against him. He sovereignly picks one. He says, "Look, I'm going to make you a great name." 
is I want to make you a blessing. Is that those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse, I will curse. And in, in you, all the nations, which are the ones that will be scattered, will be blessed. Now we know from Galatians later on, and Romans as well, that one of the primary reasons why God called Abraham was that God would have a people in which he can send his son who would become a man, this Jewish king, Christ Jesus, to die on the cross for the very nations that rebelled against him in Genesis 1 and Genesis 11. And so, um, and so Genesis 12, the election of God related to Israel, is not about Israel, it's about the glory of God to touch the nations of the earth through the glory of his son.